welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey! Hello everyone and welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, the Red Dwarf podcast here on the We Made This Podcast Network. And welcome along to our continuing coverage of Red Dwarf 10. This week we are talking, not Trojan, but fathers and sons. Sons, S-U-N-S, it's a pun. You like a pun, Mark? It's a pun. It's a pun. (laughs) It's a pun. Uh, I like a pun. Joining us, same as last week, is Mark Adams and Matt Latham. How are you doing, Matt? I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. And Mark, how, how how are you doing now? We've got one episode down. I'm still giddy as fuck. I love it. I'm delighted that there's new dwarf. New dwarf, new dwarf. More to come, but we are now coming into the second episode, which is Fathers and Sons, as I said. It was um, aired on the 11th of October, 2012. So this one, we're talking about um, continuity. is another one that's an interesting development because we're kind of going back to the Ouroboros story what did you make to this one Matt first up what are your general thoughts I oh, like this is another one that I quite like I think I really quite like this one um I think the the kind of the interesting part of it being a story that would not be able to have been done as a standalone <clears throat> you have to have had knowledge of Red Dwarf lore or in the Ouroboros episode in order to just understand the whole concept of it. I really quite like that because it means there's a development going on. It wasn't really commonplace much in um, sitcoms when Red Dwarf first started, but and it's always something that Red Dwarfs can try to kind of play with in terms of attempting to be serialised. But here it's like full on. If this is the first time watching it, you might be slightly confused. Yeah, it felt like the opposite to what they did in the last episode, where it was like, welcome back to Red Dwarf. This is a gentle rebirth, and this is like, whoa, deep cut. Yeah. It is. I mean, it does a good job of uh, explaining things, I think. Yeah, and I think it had to. It's a little bit exposition-y, but it had to be, I think, at the start of this episode. There's no way this episode would make sense if they hadn't done quite exposition-y exposition. As a second episode then, Mark, what, what do you make to this one? Um, you know, it's continuing on a bit, as I say, the Red Dwarf 10 thing. There's a, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about kind of even like the first few seconds and minutes of this episode. We've, we're doing what we did in Trojan, you know, with there's bits like the Dentibot, the Rimmer not hearing the sound uh, and stuff like that as well. So there's the, there's that continuation of the stories that threaded through the whole entire episode. But what do, what do you make generally to, the, to this episode? It was a huge amount of fun. Like Matt said, it was a brave thing to do a sequel to Ouroboros. And we'll get into the conversation about Chinese Whispers quite deeply, I suspect. Yeah, no, I think we need to because I have some thoughts on it. So um, so we'll see. And it's it's... That aspect of it, which we'll talk about, has been playing on my mind for some time, and I have difficulty passing my thoughts on it. Um, I think I have landed on some interesting thoughts, but we'll talk about that as we get into there. Um, Hmm. Yeah, so shall we dive in and uh, talk about the episode? So as I say, from the very beginning, we see... Lister playing some games on on the couch that I, you can see behind me for those people who aren't watching on the screen. As I say, we've got the uh, Red Dwarf background on. He's on that seat. He's playing a bit of games. He's uh, talking about his dentist thing. The cat comes in. The cat's outfit, Mark. The cat's outfit twice in a row. Oh, just don't. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Cat calls um, Gummy and Rimmer comes in and making that noise again. That noise thing, the tinnitus kind of idea, the, the concept that people can't hear stuff is interesting. I think at a push you could say because the hologram can hear it that no one else can, uh, you know, like similar to what teenagers can do and things like that, which which is interesting. But I think it's just there just to play off, off one another really, isn't it? Yeah, that would just to start generating mystery of 
things that's happening and stuff. But um, again, it's like it's doing it in a different way. It's doing this episode's doing it in a different way, but it's trying to incorporate different plot lines and subplots into each other in a in a similar way that Trojan did, and it's doing that quite quickly. So you've got Mister and the uh, dentist chair, and then you've got the mysterious noise that Rimmer's making. So setting up these different plot threads that's going to eventually converge with each other. But so, yeah, so it's it's on the, on, on the same foot again. It's like season series 10 has got this idea of doing more like A, B, C plots. Yeah. Which do converge to each other. So they're setting them up quite quickly. And it's quite, the pacing of it's, I think, slightly quicker than perhaps Trojan is. Most Trojan kind of beds in things in like the first scene. We just a listen and cat. This is like incorporating the whole of the, more or less the majority of the ensemble in the first instance. We do get to the, they go to the table and they start talking about various different things and uh, how Lister is going to get drunk because it's his birthday. Uh, he doesn't say drunk though. He says kishnickered. He says, I'm going to get drunk. And then he says kishnickered. I'm going to get absolutely kishnickered. <laughs> I like the word Kashnikad. It isn't quotable dwarf because quotable dwarf, as we established in the last episode, is something that has just in, in, it's like penetrated my brain from childhood. But I will use this. I like Kashnikad. I hadn't heard Kashnikad to describe drunk before. <laughs> and um, next time I get drunk, I'm going to get Kashnikad. Are you going to get talking traffic cone hugged paving liquid Kashnikad? Yes. I've never licked a pavement, but I have hugged a cone, a traffic cone. Yeah, you've hugged a traffic cone. And a I know, I know somebody that tried to get off with a lamppost because they're that drunk. I haven't done that. I I spent five minutes there and get a projector. Okay. Was she pretty? I think it was an NEC model. I think, I think it was an NEC because it was very similar to the ones we used to have at work. I know. Okay, imagine the most boring person you can think of, times it by two, and you're halfway okay. to me. <laughs> Bless him. Bless him. Um, I, actually, this is this is an interesting conversation. Um, I was in Falaraki, right? And I don't know if I've, and I've, done, I don't know if I've told you this. And you got kick, and you got, got kishnickered. Right, even to the point where Chesney Hawks was on in a nightclub. I might have talked told this story before. Chesney Hawks was on, on in, a, in a nightclub. So we went to see him. And uh, my mate was sitting, standing next to me, and I did a Del Boy. The 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 wall had an inco- had a cove in it, so I leant, I fell over, and I landed on the floor. I was that drunk that I couldn't get up. My mate Dave turned to the right to see where he could see where I went. He couldn't, he didn't know where I'd gone to, and then proceeded to go right round the nightclub to try and find me. And I was still stuck on the floor in this little alcove. That had fell over and totally Del Boyd it. Dignified. Yeah. It was all right. I was on the floor. It was a bottle. So I'd still have a drink with us. But yeah, that was what I did. In my 20s, I ran out of fingers and toes to count the number of times I passed out in a nightclub and been asked to leave. Majority of the times I ended up, in order for me to actually go out, so I ended up driving. Anyway, so I was on the soft drink. I was on the soft drinks. So I was driving everywhere. There's only been not many times that I've been out or the opportunity to go out and get drunk and. First of all, I can't remember the last time I was actually drunk. I was shocking in my twenties. I got kishnickered every fucking weekend. And the problem is when I've drunk too much, I'm like, dance, 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 fall asleep. <laughs> and so you just literally that's like exactly lost. what I did. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what I did in over 20 nightclubs in my twenties. I haven't done that for God, it's gotta be 20 years. There's there's a there's a, there's an apparent phenomenon that apparently occurs there's a sweet spot where drunk Latham turns up yes and apparently drunk Latham I've seen drunk Latham's dancing I would like on, to on, see on the video Latham's dancing I've seen that I've seen oh, the video not live, not live. I'm not seeing mm. drunk Latham's live no ah uh, yes I've seen I've seen like a happy Latham but I've not seen drunk Latham that was live I saw that like well I saw that live in person um but he, he was he was uh, good enough to go home so I didn't see it and then Obviously, me and Luke went on to a drum and bass nightclub, as you do in your forties. Yeah. <laughs> Not wrong with that. You know these things are sent to try us. Anyway, it did you get kishnickered? Got kishnickered. Got kishnickered. Did you? Yeah, good. Yeah, it was good. Kishnickered. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's Father's Day, and uh, 
there's a conversation, and I'll just say that the expo- like we said at the top of the hour, there's the whole um, explanation with um, kind of like the, the exposition piece where Rimmer's going, but you're your own dad. And the card comes out. Uh, and then we get Crichton makes the appearance, obviously, for the new card that he's going to have, because obviously he hasn't written the new the, the first card yet. He's got the new card. The, mm. the card from last year comes. The, but yeah, there's also the kind of key point where he says that he, he, he drinks himself into oblivion so he can't remember the night before. He gets kishnicked. Yeah. Yeah. On Gelf Hooch as well. Gelf Hooch is what he gets um, thing. And it's not his fault that due to some time traveling paradoxy sci-fi smeg that he's his own dad. I used to drink Hooch. Not Gelf Hooch. Like Reef and alcoholic lemonade. Reef. I used to get kishnicked on Hooch. Did you strawpedo it? Is that what you used to do? Do you straw pedo? Yes. I can. I. I. I never tried straw. No, I think I tried it once and failed, and then so never did it again. The thing about straw pedos, we used to call them bottle bongs as well. The you could do it dead easy, but I just belched for the <laughs> entire night <laughs> after that. It. Well, it was. You know, it, it ended up being a bit gassy. My acid reef looks as flared just thinking about I, it. I am. Um, I, oh, oh, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, the acid reef. Oh, my, oh, my God. Yeah. I, I would I would still drink lager until I just couldn't drink it anymore. And Stropedo was my next step before getting the shots because I wasn't a shot drinker. Um, it was always like, right, okay, I can't, we can't do any more. Last rounds would be bottles. Um, and I rather, <laughs> I don't know whether to say this or not because it is quite gross. But, um, there was one time I was in the local working men's club where I was that drunk that I started to torpedo, snickered, snickered, cone um, hugging as well. Um, that I needed to go on to Smirnoff Ice because I just couldn't drink anymore. I torpedoed that, and I still had a few of them. And then, right at, towards the end of the night, bear in mind this was only like midnight. I then threw up into a pint glass, and it was a perfect pint. It was a perfect pint and even had a head on it. Uh, and then an old woman, look. apparently, because I don't remember this, but my friend said this, an old woman said, is he going to drink that? <laughs> <laughs> Why did she want I it? I think so. <laughs> uh, so but she didn't know. And then they took the glass and apparently it was boiling hot. It was really, like, really hot. Uh, Drinking other people's sick is the kind of fetish that you don't want to hear about, is yeah, it? Exactly. Matt's even taking his earphones off. I am very, very squeamish. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but there, that was that, and it was it was perfect, absolutely to the brim, had head the lot. I did manage... and comatose only on the. <laughs> <laughs> I did manage to, um, if we're talking about puke because it freaks out Matt. I did manage to, um... uh, right? You, you know, everyone's got a drink that you don't drink anymore because in your youth it was the one that fucked you mine is cider and the uh and my 18th or 19th birthday i can't remember which one my mate pete was driving his dad's posh car and i was sat in the front and i'd as i was kishnickered and um i must i must have been drinking something pink maybe red wine or something i was like i'm gonna be sick and then I put my head out the window and yacked. And it was like he got a fucking racing stripe on his dad's car with my sick. Oh. It was rank. Oh. Absolutely rank. Uh, another one from for us and like when we're in the band, and it's this wasn't that long ago actually. This is this wasn't that long ago. Um there was a bang on the door and I was driving at this point and uh, I'd seen some police I'd seen some police activity and we had people in the van that we shouldn't have had, had in the van. And they were saying, Can you get I need to get out, I need to get out, I need to get out, I need to puke, I need to puke. So he opened the side door and he got out and proceeded to like literally fall flat on his face before he puked. But what he actually fell flat into was a full bed of nettles. (laughs) Face first, the entire thing, like the entire body was like stinging and everything for days. You have been listening to Drinks, Nectar and (laughs) Comatose. Nice. Nice. It's just been waiting. It's just been winding that up. Um, okay, let's talk about dreads. Because that's the present he gets. He gets some dreads. Ah, <laughs> oh, 
Oh. <laughs> and a Papa Dom. Oh, look like at Papa Dom. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I know Crossable Dwarf might not be a thing for you, Mark, but I was watching this thing Sunday evening. Um, Sunday evening. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yesterday. Um, but the night before, I was. I had a in- Indian takeaway. Uh, I was watching watching Doctor Who, and so I had a Papa Dom with it. And like, just as I was finished, I still realised that there was. I still had a bit of Papa Dom that was hidden under my plate. That I'd, and I was like, oh, that's a bit of Papa Dom. <laughs> 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 so, but, but the thing is, that's not the first time that's like crossed my head. So now, every time that I end up, if I have a, if I'm having an Indian meal or something, and there's Papa Doms involved, it's like, oh, a bit of Papa Dom. Oh, not doing it. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh! Wait a minute. How can you even stand your own dad? He abandoned you in a pub in a cardboard box. So I, I love that. I actually, I know it's a bit expositiony, but I kind of like the fact that you can play that both ways, and I like the fact that they've done that little bit of a a, a dichotomy. I think it's quite good. It's very clever. But also quite like. I think it's. It's Rimmer being Rimmer, but also he's not being mean. Mm. So he's not he's not just meant to try and take him down. I think he's trying to give just a dose of reality to Lister. You <laughs> know, technically it's absurd that he's still a bit absurd that he's actually talking about himself that he gave, gave himself in a box. But I quite like I quite like that how Rimmer's characterised here. Okay, so we shall we talk about I slit the sheet, the sheet I slit, I slit the sheet. <laughs> You just did, and I'm not going to try and say it. <laughs> the the Rimmer Crichton storyline with the dispensers. Okay, so hmm. Mark, let, let, let you start with this. How 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 are you feeling about about this thread okay, right the way so, through? Because there's there's some elements that are interesting. I just wondered what to get your take on this this part of the show. So it's a brave thing to tackle, and in a lot of ways, they treat it with some sensitivity. The major problem is that the character of Taiwan Tony isn't played by someone from that ethnic background. That is a huge problem. It feels like they should have known better by now. But if we highlight that and point that out, it is actually quite an interesting idea. And it's quite a clever gag that the way a well i'm gonna use the scientific term because funnily enough i had a look up i don't want to use the word i don't really want to refer to that game as chinese whispers anymore um so i looked it up there is a term for it in cultural evolution research it's called transmission chaining which is completely and utterly soulless (laughs) americans americans use the term telephone or broken telephone um in china they call it geese to geese and in france they call it arab phone so france has the same <laughs> issue that we have in the uk um i definitely wouldn't call it arab phone either that sounds like a really sounds like a really crap a girls game from the 90s so you got dream phone <laughs> i had a copy of dream phone like 20 years later but i i, had, I did have a go at dream phone. um And, you know, there's different contexts, usages of Chinese whispers. There's like Chinese whispers is a game, but also when something has been miscommunicated, people would say that it was all Chinese whispers as well. Um, For that, I would use crossed wires and I have used crossed wires much more than I would have ever used Chinese whispers Mm. just coincidentally. I don't think that that's really used in that context anymore. Um, And also who plays that game anymore? It's well old, and we've got games consoles. I had to do a similar thing um, for my university degree that I'm currently doing, um, which I'm sure most people have done before or they've had variations of this, is where the class had to sit back to back. So, you know, you're just in the normal classroom. You just get told, like, you need to sit away, look at a wall. doesn't matter where you are, as long as you just, like, because we're in a kind of U shape, so you could look to the wall. And you had to count to the number of people, like count to 10 or count to 15 or count to 20 but you weren't allowed to pass any information on. So you had to work out. And then if somebody said something at the same time, you would have to then start again. 
and it's it was all about like sort of working out the teamwork and how you would actually do it so it'd be kind of like you know you people would start and it'd be like one two there'd be a massive gap and then someone would say two people would say three and it's trying to work out without the verbal just verbal communication trying to work out how you do something but wow you're actually doing it and i thought that was an interesting interesting take but it just goes to show how key communication is because you know often we talk about like sort of verbal but the non-verbal is really important if we go to talk about this particular thing and the, the thing that like you say i think it it is the thing i've been struggling with for, for quite some time with it because like you say the, the soulless transmission um is, is an interesting point and telephones probably i've heard that being mentioned actually at some point in the long distant past i've completely forgot it was called that at some point hmm. but what i find fascinating with the way that they display it here and as you say they try to do is i find really fascinating because they're trying to portray rimmer in a position of i'm trying to do my best but i might like i might try i might get it wrong and I quite like that concept of like him going, I, I think you'll find it's racist, you know, and, and I think him trying to like see that and develop that and not necessarily yeah. get it. And I, and I, and I, I like that because he says it in those little hats, which is like, Oh, okay. You know, but he's trying. And I, I do like that concept of, of like, he's at least taking it on board and, and moving it on. And then it just, it, it's just left to the rest of the, the site. And then obviously the, the, um, uh, the dispensers take up take it up after that. So I did read a few articles on it written by people of Chinese backgrounds, and essentially the general consensus is that the the term Chinese whispers isn't racist. It's culturally insensitive, yeah. and you should probably try harder. But racism suggests intent, whereas this name is from way beyond when there was any kind of intent and it's not the same way as actively using a curse word against a person of that background i won't use that again i will probably use like i say crossed wires but it's you know i, I also wouldn't use it's all greek to me either because again it's similar context i wouldn't use the term double dutch it's a similar context there's no hatred behind them per se it's just a bit kind of you should do a bit better. The only real issue I have with this, to be honest with you, I think, again, 12 years ago, we probably weren't as aware of cultural insensitivity as we are now. Uh, the only issue I have with it is that, that Taiwan Tony isn't Chinese or Taiwanese. or And it's a shame because otherwise I think they actually address it relatively well. Yeah, so while you was talking, I was I Googled um, The Problem with the Poo, which is a documentary film from 2017, where the comedian Harry Kondabolu, um talked about the casting of the character of a poo from The Simpsons and the fact that it's been done by Hank Azaria and the kind of the problematic connotations around it. And that was about, so that's about five years from this. So, yeah. so that so that conversation of trying to of casting role casting roles of race, like of like characters of race or vocal characters of race, um, with voice actors of the same heritage type thing. But that's still a kind of recent thing. Um, the I think Big Mouth, Big Mouth. I think it was season four. They recast the character of Missy with an African American actress. Um, because she was voiced by a white actress for about three seasons, but they tied it in. Well, they actually tied that in with the the new voice actress with the character, the character fight, like looking into a kind of family heritage and stuff, and embracing uh, black culture as part of a character arc and everything. Or the sensitivity towards racial casting of characters and actors of the same race. I don't think that was as probably as culturally aware as it has been now back in 2012 i still think that's kind of relatively recent kind of cultural shift i think you're right i think they might have probably considered it but it wasn't something that was as prominent as it was 
until after the problem with the poo. You're right. What's quite interesting is that um, if you, I mean, so I read into the problem with the poo and stuff. Is um, Hank Azaria's kind of reaction to it? He said he steps away instantly. He says, "You know what? We need to step aside." And I think he's actually then he actually went on to go to talks and kind of read into the kind of, that the kind of like concept of um, stereotyping and casting stuff so he kind of ended up kind of when people say oh i'm going to go off to learn and reflect to my actions and stuff and there's i, I don't there's never any kind of malice between that casting and i don't think there's malice here i don't think there's kind of like deliberately racist malice in here as well no not at all as well but um but the I fact they're that, tackling it suggests that they're not racist yeah. you know yeah yeah um but i think yeah, but hang azari kind of went back and said that uh, and went through and actually kind of went on courses and talks and lectures around the subject to kind of educate himself on that um, afterwards. And it's one of the few instances where, like, because you have kind of apologies where I'm going to go back and reflect on actions and stuff and they never do. Whereas I think because of this, Hank Azaria actually has done that. Mm. It's, it's, it's an interesting cultural shift of, of, of things that happen and stuff, which kind of make, which makes sense, which probably should have done earlier, but. It's an important one, but it hadn't happened before this episode. So it's we had to highlight it because, well, frankly, I'm me. But um, <laughs> I think it is what it is where we can kind of like retroactively go, it wasn't okay then, it isn't okay now. But during the time, it, I, I think it was a genuine mistake rather than having any malice. I think the actual subplot's role is to try and tackle or kind of try to tackle the, the idea of that. Cultural. It just fell into it. Mm. Fell into it, didn't Inverting it? Inverting, yeah, kind of, yeah. Like inadvertent coaching. thing. So, like it's the idea. Oh, he's Ch- our Chinese whispers racist. He's like they're actually tackling that. And I guess what's frustrating is that they'd used Richard Ng in Back to Earth. They could have just given him a call. Yeah, it's a vocal um, thing as well, isn't it? So it didn't need to be on set. Even in 2012, we could have done that. So yeah, okay. The only other thing with that that joke is the finish and again how stories join together in this abc plot kind of thing in that stasis is the key word which is why the racist thing has to happen it's because it's got to go from racist to stasis and i I do think it's a little bit weak but having said that we are looking about the next scene which is in the dentibot and i know this is a bit of a love hate for certain people that i've seen online and things but i love the dentibot tough love tough love (laughs) <laughs> ah, and, and 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 it's quite clever the story isn't it with the, having like obviously it's his own dad that let's set up uh dave lister jr in the in the file so then we can release that um later on in the episode um what what do you make to the actual scene and also the actual um area because it's it's an interesting part of the ship i think what's interesting is that you know it was a electronic head projected onto a screen and then they talk about holly later on i really missed holly because of this okay and i i want more hattie and do we know why there wasn't holly in this series was it budgetary or did norman say no because he saw his ass that he wasn't in back to earth or do we know why I, th- I just think it's probably the same reason they didn't include Holly in series six in that. And I think this is something that as much as I really liked, as I love season series five, it was gradually clear that Holly was just getting redundant as a character because a lot of the exposition that Holly would deliver yeah, was just being shunted to Crichton. So Crichton was getting all that dialogue anyway. So it, Holly wasn't really needed at any point. Anymore mm. in terms of a cat, in, in terms of the ensemble, in terms of the running of the ship, then definitely yes. But in terms of the cat, in terms of the, of the cast, it was it was getting clear there was just struggling to give Holly stuff to do, yeah, because Crichton was getting all the exposition. If you think about that last episode being a Rimmer episode, this episode is a Lister episode as well, um, as it needs to focus on, on that. And I know there's obviously like lit Rimmer parts in this, and it's interesting in the Dentibok thing that he does say, oh, well, read a book, which is like kind of a returning thing to um, to the show, which I thought was a, a nice yes. touch. You know, and then obviously thinks he's Hendrix and stuff. So all of that is all playing into that. If you haven't seen Red Dwarf before, I'm my own dad. This is the ethos and the mythology of the show. 
he, I'm not going anywhere. I'm a bit of a bum. Um, well, he doesn't say bum, does he? He says, I'm not, I'm not a bum. You know, he, he's not a bum. You know, I mean, um, he sees a total bum. It may be a bum, a bum maybe, not a total bum, which which I thought was a nice, a nice touch, actually. Which reminds me again of Holly when she called him a space bum. Oh, you see, it reminds me of it of of um, justice. Is it justice or a quizzer? Just a bum. And and even like sort of how evil that Medibot gets when it's like it's magic. It's really yeah. really evil. It's not quite the Doctor in Star Trek, is it? In this scene as well, is that um, also the idea of like oh. Because like the Medibot doesn't know about the fact that List is talking about himself. Because oh, we'll set up a a new yeah. file for Dave Lister for your son. What's the name? Dave Lister. Oh, Dave Lister Junior. Because okay then. So and that's quite that's quite an important yeah. part of the the story. So it's a kind of like again throwaway moment that becomes like a key part of resolving the the actual problem that she finds herself in. So again, it's like these different seedings of plots and stories kicking yeah, in definitely and paying off yeah N- nice and, like nicely woven together again so the next scene we've got Crichton and Rimmer together again it seems to be a recurring theme and uh, they're ready to launch the new computer not Holly not Holly Mark this is the new computer this is pre well this is well no this is Cassandra this is pre is it this is Cassandra is it Cassandra is it Cassandra? It's so Cassandra. Cassandra can see the future, pre-predicts it. There's two different. It's it, two different things. I think. I th- it feels very similar very soon, because Cassandra was series eight, right? Back to Earth doesn't count. This is literally the next series. This this is basically the next series. So it whilst it was fun and she was cool, she was basically kind of Cassandra Quig, really. I, I don't. I'm, I'm not super cross about it, but if I was going to be critical, it would be that they have brought a character similar to Cassandra back too soon. Might be nice to have had Cassandra back. Actually. I don't. I. I don't know. He's 14 years too soon. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. That's. Uh, suppose. And no fucker watch series eight more than once. Shade. <laughs> I did. Um, Shall we? Because no. you love Pete Part Two so much, isn't it? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Isn't it? Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I do like. Um, I do just quite like the kind of like the the character creation yeah. screen, like the RPG stuff. It goes. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't twenty five. Doesn't really matter. Just just twenty five. Well, uh, just uh, it's okay. I'll pick the first one. Hang on. You, you don't, you don't, you don't just pick the first one. <laughs> it's a level of shallow that is very funny about Rimmer, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And it's just like he keeps like sort of pointing down. And he keeps going, "What's that one down there? Well, that's thirty six D, sir." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just, just pick that one. No, oh, crying, crying, crying. And again, but then this is another example of this series focusing on the fact that Rimmer's Rimmer's actually technically superior, like the, the superior officer of, of everyone goes, but don't make me pull rank. I am ordering I'm putting I'm pulling rank down do I'm ordering you to select the yeah. I don't know why you're making a fuss about this. Just select the <laughs> It escalates, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. And, and the Crichton's complete and utter cluelessness is brilliant because as we've established, the character is basically asexual. And, uh, th- and then when he sex- selects the frame size, which is always fascinating, when when because Rimmer's going, no, 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 that's no, not the frame size I want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think two Holly alikes in one episode make me go, oh, it's true. Yeah, I didn't think of it as like in that perspective that they have got two two like AI robots kind of thing. I think the difference being is that these are this is actually in two intelligence. For their own, for their own good. Oh, pre is kind of like pre predictive behavior stuff. It's, it's, it's your like old school Red Dwarf gimmicky episode kind of thing where it's like they find a kind of sci fi gimmick or idea and they run with it. So, like, you take your backwards or your white holes and yeah. stuff. 
where, you, where they've got like a sci-fi gimmick and they're playing with it. And but it also like because it, it really, I mean, if we because we haven't really talked about this, and this is something that I actually find fascinating with this show as well. Like exactly what you're saying, because it it, ta- it starts to talk about the CCTV coverage and it builds personalities off that CCTV. That's very prescient, you know, in in a lot of ways. You know, it's like, in fact, it's building that algorithm mm. kind of thing. And that's something Red Dwarfs missed for some time. It's interesting that that's starting to come in. There's like things that we can now talk about, you know, whether or not, you know, like the the, the telephone thing we just talked about or this in like sort of, you know, how it predicts people's behavior and things. It's kind of like come full circle a little bit, ironically in a robberous episode, but um, it's come full circle. Mm. It's actually, there's stuff to talk about in that regard. And I find that, I do find that fascinating that this has come around this way. With, but the, uh, particularly when there's often gags of the retro, sorry, the retro technology that the show uses that you kind of always want to, the same with the phone, where the phone was deliberately because that's probably what, they would have done in mm. the 80s to try and make a cordless phone. Um, in the next scene, it's in the next scene, it's VHSs that Lister, Lister's dad leaves him. Yeah. To watch. It's, yeah. it's a VHS, it's a tape video, it's not, it's not a disc. They kind of deliberately make that conscious decision to, and it, it, might, it might have eaten up some of the budget to try and find a bunch of VHSs. Um, if they wanted to be <laughs> really, really referential, they could have made them triangular. That's true. true. That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing, which has only just cottoned onto my mind as well, talking about Cassandra and, and 14 years difference, and I'm talking from a Star Trek perspective, and it's not happened here because it, this didn't exist now, but it's just something that I find fascinating, is that you look at the cadence that Cassandra speaks compared to Pre. Pre is literally like rhyming off hundreds of words a second. She's like going, you know, you no longer need to have this conversation. Ninety eight percent, blah 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 blah. Cassandra is very much like, I've seen it; it's already happened, and that, in some ways, just shows you how far, how fast they, people perceive things now. Because I remember watching the very first episode of Star Trek Lower Decks and thinking, "My God, that's fast!" You know, it was literally just rhyme after rhyme yeah. after rhyme, and the rhythms of this is is like a lot quicker than than what we'd expect. Um, which works for it in in its style, but I just think in comparison with Cassandra, that's an interesting um, thing that I've just noticed just now. Really, shall we talk about the next scene? <laughs> shall we talk about this? Shall we talk about oh, Robo? No memory of the previous night. Lissa comes out. Of a trolley, of a thing, of a, <laughs> of a with his, uh, you know, his kebab as a pillow. He's got a letter with a VHS on it, which has to Dad Love Dave, or to Dave Love Dad, even. And he slides the VHS into a machine underneath the desk and uses a remote control. And then we see Daddy Dave. So I want to go back. Where's the worst place you've woken up with a hangover? Have you woken up in a bath? No, I don't really do that. I I have a homing beacon. So, like, my brain just goes, oh. So I could be literally talking to you now. I'd be absolutely kishnickered. And then all of a sudden, ah. I'll just see a fire door, and I'll walk out that fire door, and I'm home. So I don't tend to, and I tend to, like, sort of, I have a crash on the couch or crash in the bed. I don't really... I don't have any real stories of me doing anything other than that, really. I think the only time that I've I've maybe fell asleep, actually, like you say, like in nightclubs and stuff, where I've nodded off and gone, oh, crap, and then I've gone home. That's that's as close as I've ever been to doing something like that. I mean, I've had classics like waking up on a sofa in a house I don't know and leaving without even saying hello to whose fucking house it was. But um, the best one, woke up. And um, no memory of the previous night. Look to my left. Ah. Well done, Mark. He's hot. Look to my right. Ah. Well done, Mark. He's hot too. No memory. <laughs> no memory of it. But I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> Just have no idea what happened, but it's fine. No, we, uh, we then we had lots of sex. It's great. Well, as good as it can be when you've got a hangover. <laughs> and you've got to worry about two cocks. Well, three cocks. 
<laughs> I'm glad you corrected yourself there. I was <laughs> having a second. Uh, anyway, let's let's get back to Daddy Dave. Daddy Dave is uh, an experience. Mark, you're the first one. You, you we saw this live watching you watch it. What did you think to it on your first watch? Old, absolutely howled. The guitar genius, just, just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You and Colin, Colin especially howled at that guitar joke. I remember that quite oh, clearly. Yeah. It was like, oh yeah. And I loved the, you don't understand me. I hate you. And he's the same bloke. Brilliant. Bastard. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Just brilliant. I always, always howl. And he said he does a good drunk when he falls off the chair and then falls off it again. That that yeah. time. It's just because he's got this cheeky smile when, when he gets back up. It's just brilliant. And it's, it's, it's apple juice, I think it is, isn't it? Um, Matt, because I think he did talk about that in in a making of or a or a three million years thing, but it obviously is just apple juice that he's firing down. But it it does such a good job of of portraying the two characters, and uh, mm. you know, and said wrong, wrong. <laughs> you think I'm going to do what you say, do you? <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact is, like, no, you just play. It. So do that bit, and then play the next bit of video. I was like, oh, so you don't No, because I know you, you played it. You jumped ahead, didn't you? Wonderful. Now enroll in the engineering program, get the tooth fixed, and find Christy. And Daddy discipline. I mean, just <laughs> that little handshake of like slapping him across the face. Oh, you get some more Daddy discipline. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> I also like that he's unshaven in the video, and he's and he's obviously had a few, maybe like a couple of days stubble. On the following thing, just to Never. give the i just to give the idea of concepts of time and and change, but yeah, it is such a it's a great great scene, and again goes back to like for me, I think that this is a highlight. This is like what uh, Matt was saying last week with the, um, the moose joke. I, I I this is this is high up in my list of favorite moments. It is it's not necessarily the best moment I've ever seen, but it is up mm. there with some of the best dwarf in the BBC era for me. I'm doing okay. It's great. But I think it's, but again, it's like, it's, it's exploring a different side of character to list that we've not really seen it's, before. It's going up. So yeah. it's, it's doing something yeah. new. It fills in character and it's just enjoyable to watch because it's capitalizing and building on the lore and backstory of Lister as a character and addressing quite a few of his flaws mm. as well. And it's, I, I, just, I just think it's a very, it's a, it's a really good scene. Well, Mark, mm. I think you, you maybe asked this question a while back about, um, you know, I, I, is it just going to be the same old Red Dwarf or are they going to even reference the fact that they're getting older? And uh, and this kind of showcases that they are actually, you know, showcasing yeah. they are older than what they are, obviously, the dad figure and, you know, and utilising that, I think. And I think that's an answer to that question for you, really, I think. Yeah, I think so. This is the second reference of Chrissy. Yes. Find Chrissy, so she's this, she's gone build somewhere. Build a proper home. Find Chrissy. He can build a proper home. So I think that's utilizing that. And that, and as you say, um, the guitar gag. I mean, it's it's in you, again. I, I mentioned it before, but on my backdrop, you can see the guitar case. It's just brilliant because it's just like it's the way that Craig Charles plays it and looks at it and goes, "What's he up to?" You know and. Knowing, like, and I think talking about like sort of new audiences, if the new audience probably won't have as much connection to that as we would, they would find it funny. But we know it is whole nature, the fact that that guitar is his whole thing, and for for himself as his dad to throw it out of an airlock and put it half a light year away is just it is great. You know, it's the fact that he's, he's just gone right. I know what will really piss him off is going to be his guitar. And, you know, that is such a parent, adult, child thing to do, isn't it? It's just like say, okay, you know, let's throw the Xbox out the window. Let's hide the PS5. Very much so. Very much so. And um, I I had various things confiscated as a kid. I don't think my dad ever destroyed any of my shit, but he definitely confiscated my Sinclair Spectrum. Slight deviation. I just, I just jumped ahead. I jumped ahead, but... Um, 
the trivia section of this episode um, about because of the fact it's Rimmer that points out the Rob the yeah. Ross stuff. Um, I'll read this paragraph. It's unknown how Rimmer recalls the events of Ouroboros. It's possible they uploaded the old Rimmer's memories that went off to be Ace Rimmer to the new hologram who was rescued by the nanobots and back to the red, becoming a hologram again at some point or whatever. However, Rimmer, in any incarnation, was not actually present during any of the events of Ouroboros, so must have somehow been informed after the fact. Well, you know, they have got a number of years where they have to talk at some point. Yeah, I think he's just been told, hasn't he? <laughs> Wait a minute. You're your own dad. You were left in a cardboard box. You, you, you're going you're gonna to talk about that, aren't you, at some point, even if the cat says it. I think that's the answer. <laughs> Rimmer's TV watching habits of where the South win is certainly an interest. <laughs> I mean, we've got Man and High Castle as a perfect example of that, isn't it, where, you know, Germans are actually the winners of, of World War. Um, so... Pre has already watched them and he didn't enjoy it. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. But, I mean, Cassandra was obviously like trying to survive herself. She's just going, yeah, well, I'm doing everything for you. And obviously it plays up because, you know, the fact that he's going, he, he needs to repair the ship. So she's prepared. She's repaired the ship as he would pre- uh, repair it is just fantastic. But yeah, the, the, the TV scene. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's perfect. It's perfect. The South Wind, Matt, the TV show, and the blonde dies, unfortunately, and he didn't enjoy it. What do you think to the TV? Because the TV is clearly like it's on its side for pre, and it's clearly a normal TV that's put put in a landscape view because it's got an archway <laughs> at the bottom of the screen. The economics of um, making the I like how they put like three gold things on to cover it though. They've put like they've made they've done some effort. I, I didn't notice that, but I think you were looking at it in a different way to be main host compared to me. I'm still in kind of happy, happy, joy, joy, new Red Dwarf mode. Maybe I need to watch these a few more times because that's the second thing that I've missed that is quite easy to spot. I wouldn't worry about it. Enjoy it. This is like a, it's an education, Mark. It's an education. Yeah, uh, no, I've just seen it yourself. Yeah, I've seen it myself. It's just it's a TV. <laughs> it just rotated. <laughs> I mean, the monitors are fine because they're in the right landscape, but it's like it's clearly a TV that's just been rotated. It's uh, it's fascinating, but um, it is in the bunk because the bunks are uh, out there. But the um, the fact that, that she watched it, as I say, the build up to to the show um, and and that kind of like maybe you can finally read War and Peace, and you wanted to relax. Everyone, I think, can relate to that where you just kind of go, I know I have to edit an episode of Shipwrecked and Comatose. But I want to go home and relax. You know, it's that kind, of, isn't it? It's always that kind of like. <laughs> now you've got it. You, you you never do the main thing that you always would want to do. It's always got to be something easier. Um, and I think people can relate. Any of you ever heard? I don't know if if I've spoken about this on this podcast. I, I remember speaking to someone. Have you ever heard of something called the CSA? It's a kind of mockumentary um, set in a world where the Confederates won. So it's and it's and it's like a documentary. It's 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 framed like a British documentary. So a British documentary team was allowed entry into the CSA um, to, to to film. So and they 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 discover a kind of shocking revelation that will change the whole way the CSA is run. Um, and so they, they've got they've got this they've got this film out, but the, the documentary team were never seen again. And it's just basically this documentary about the states but if the federate federations win and it's basically just legalized slavery so it opens up with it says we look after you and your property and it and pans across to a basically a gardener who's black and the idea you suddenly realize crap this is what happens when slavery is illegal is legal in the modern day mm. and it's it's a fascinating it's a fascinating kind of like look into kind of like racist depictions from early stuff but it's Whenever they, whenever anyone brings up that alternative history, that that always brings into into mind of that film, which no seems like no one's ever heard of, <laughs> apart from yeah. Me. I'd say the man, the man in high castles, kind of mind the Frank Spotnitz um, show. So, um, as I say, they go to B deck and B deck's completely destroyed, and uh, which is which is great. And there's a there's a thing in here, and and it it's the other way around for me. It's when everything's breaking down and they don't have the conversation 
And then Rimmer looks at Crayon and just like nods at him and then walks away. And there's a scene in Star Trek Picard season three where Picard's walking down <laughs> like the ship and he's, he's surrounded by a guard of honor. And he looks at the guy and you find out he's actually, there's a body in there, but Picard looks at the guy and nods. And I instantly think of Rimmer. It's like, it's the way that like Patrick Stewart nods and it's like exactly the same as the way he does it. And, yeah, I just, and I can't, I can't get over that anymore. It's like, cause he's just the way he points, he points at Crichton and then goes, nod. Back in the Medi Bay, you've got to think ahead, Mark. You do. Yes, you do. It's just so beautifully catty. They've they've got the cat. But they've, they've, I mean, obviously they have. But it yeah, it's fun. It's so much fun. It's yeah. You didn't think ahead. Didn't think ahead. <laughs> no. No, you didn't. Yeah, but I think this guy's well, well, can't you just share it? Never ask a cat to share. <laughs> yeah. Again. <laughs> Look, the, the way my cat protects her food. Yeah, absolutely. And then we get to the final kind of moments, really. The kind of final act is that pre that Daddy Dave has uh, resigned from the Jupiter Mindership Corporation. And that means that Pre has the ability to eject him from the ship. And former crewman Lister has to be tricked into going outside with yeah. um how do you think this this last act worked did it work for you matt did it not work is it a bit ropey do you find it great how how, how do you feel about these the last few scenes here? i like i liked it i didn't love it um but i think it's kind of an interesting but i think particularly with how the story works is that i think the it's more or less the plot kicks in to bring some kind of peril, which stakes or raise tension mm. or something, just just because the show can kind of loses a bit of the character work that was happening with Lister, even though it does build up to the fact that the, the events, the, the everything that's been the, the resolution is caused because of what Dave, what Lister's mm. did, Lister did by setting up his own son and stuff. Um, it does feel as if the plot overruns and takes away a bit of the character focus of the episode and kind of like the A and B plots kind of flip, yeah. flip around. So the A, suddenly the B plots near the A plots and the A plots near the B plot. Um, so a bit uneven on that bit, but I don't know. I think, I think it's quite clever. I think it is clever how Lister tricks pre into kind of, into going shutting down, but it is, it is something that, but it is kind of something we have seen before mm. where Lister kind of uses his, his kind of like talent for empathy and empathy and quick thinking to kind of resolve and out trick the untrickable. Yeah. Because I know you mentioned Cassandra and in, in the past, in that episode, he kind of works out what a plan is. Yeah. And I think he, and he does it. Um, there's another one. There's another one where he does something similar. I think is it Inquisitor. Oh, you mean um, justice in the justice field with the sim? Yeah, this, it's, it's, it's something that the show's done before, where he manages to out trick, yeah. out trick um, intelligence is more advanced than him. And I can't. Yeah, I think it's that. It's 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 happened a few times. What do you think, Mark, to this this final act then? Because there's there's a little bit to go as well. There's the um, obviously list has to get off the ship, and then he has this kind of two thousand and one moment where he comes back. Um, and you've also got the now that list has gone, the mission's changed as well. So, what what do you make to this final act? I think it's very very dwarfy. It feels similar in kind of convoluted complexity to something like Thanks for the Memory. Maybe not quite as com complex, but it feels like chain of events, all kind of. It's tied up in a bow. Everybody's safe again. It feels like that. And I'm down with that. I was surprised that they allowed Craig Charles to have so many props, to be fair. <laughs> That's not the question you asked. I know, but I'm just... Uh... Oh, man, this, uh, the three, you just wait the three, there's a whole section dedicated to that in a million years, <laughs> yeah, there isn't is there? Like where there's like, <laughs> and there's like a montage of just him breaking... 
but yeah, well, and the, the, the reason why I say that for you, as I say, you get shunted out the airlock, and then we get the there's the scene, the scene in which is the final kind of push before Lister comes and saves the day with Lister Junior, where they have uh, like ninety years. Oh, did I say years? Which seems a bit weird that Pre would get that wrong. Oh, I meant minutes. Um, you know, and they would drive into the sun. She's become malicious at this point, though, it feels. Like, did, rather than logical and emotionless, it does feel like she's become malicious, or at least it did to me. But it's is that down to logic, logic and predictive behaviour of the crew? Yeah, so saying, exactly oh. that. She's got that from Rimmer. So, and I think it's quite, it is quite interesting. I think this, and this is something I think I know you've Mark's mentioned this on particular episodes I've not been in that deal with AI and the kind of depiction of empathy and stuff, and particularly with Crichton. And in some places, Holly, in that they've got they develop because of age, the programs kind of end up assume accumulating logic and into the kind of some kind of emotion and stuff which gives them traces of humanity which is down to lister's uh influence and in, in and in some places you could argue the same thing is ha- is actually with rim because rimmer all rimmer is is an ai that's just got duplicate duplicated subroutines of a yeah. memory cell so you've got whereas with pre she just automatically just goes over the edge because she just can't constantly go skynet <laughs> and just thinks oh yeah so uh, no matter everything that i calculate this is going to end up in catastrophe so we're just going to drive into the sun and it is down to lister's resignation yeah yeah this is, or and it's this lister's humanity and quick thinking that saves the day to it so it's and i think that quite i find that quite interesting particularly particularly when you've got other ai characters in the show the fact that it, it kind of become very Red Dwarf eight as well when he's flying back into the into the scoop, it, it, it just reminded <laughs> yes. me of that. Um, and then, like we say, with uh, the fact that when he gets on board and he and we get a bit of tension with the the stasis and and joining up and linking up together with that, that you then get what um, Mark was a bit like uh, thing with when. They're all like sort of enjoying themselves and playing music and the air guitar and the like, and that's in the trail. And it's interesting, like, you know, well, why are they all enjoying themselves? And obviously, it's because they've literally just been spared the lives because this has saved them. So, yeah, I enjoyed that dance immensely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I did, I did like the laughing gas though, as well. I did thought the laughing gas section was quite funny. You know, it's like, um, oh, yeah, we're all going to die. <laughs> and it's like, so she sealed it up. It's now, oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, which I thought, so I enjoyed, I enjoyed that aspect of it too. The thing about laughing gas, the thing about laughing gas is it affects organic mammalian bodies <laughs> and neither Crichton <laughs> nor Rimmer would be susceptible to <laughs> a gas. I don't care, but it's a smeg up, isn't it? That's true. That's true. And it is, it's, it's undeniably funny, but yeah. Neither of them are breathing that shit in. And that comes to the end of the episode. Is there anything that I missed? Any notes that you've got? Anything you want to discuss? There's there's a, there's a few deleted scenes. Okay. On this. That was on the DVD slash Blu-ray. And he's on it and he's referenced on the on the wiki again. Um so yeah, so there's a there's a bit after the Flushing out guitar where Rimmer, like this is going down the corridor upset and waves it to Rimmer saying, It's not fair. It's not to him and stuff. Um there's a scene where I think you actually see there's a scene where he actually chickens out of the of the where he sits down to yeah. do the, the, the operation on his tooth and then that's when he runs out. Um there's there's apparently a bit more of Rimmer deciding whether he'll be whether he'd prefer to be switched off or left on to burn to death. Um, and there's apparently seeing it, the cat wonders how hot the the star is, and Christ is going, it's very hot. Um, and I think there's actually another scene where this is actually applying for the robotics course as well right. to be cut out, which, on the sounds of it, doesn't just seems to be there and not actually funny. So uh, yeah, it's been quite quite a few kind of transitional scenes, I think. But yeah, the robotics course actually comes out at the very end, doesn't it? Because they say about the um, I'm going to pass it. He says about the pass, the pass in the robotics course, and then he gets the zero G, and it's not kickboxing; it's something else, isn't it? 
total, yeah, total football. football. Um, and he says, like, the weekend, your, your ice is mine. I always thought that was a bit weird that there's it just comes out of nowhere, that, that thing. I'm just going to, ah, I'm going to sign up to the, the robotics mechanism. So um, engineering course. So that makes that makes a bit of sense. Um, yeah. So that's it. Mark, have you got anything else that you want to mention? The only thing is quite frivolous, but um, it's well known that I am a massive Doctor Who fan. And um, the spiky wall things, there's an episode of Doctor Who called Paradise Towers from the 80s, which had these evil cleaners in it. And this reminded me of that so much, the peril of these cleaners coming towards you through corridors, you couldn't get past them. And it's kind of irrelevant, really, but Paradise Towers is a fun Doctor Who story from Sylvester McCoy. There's a part where Pre distracts Lister by having someone say Dave. Now, is that archive vocal for vocal takes of Chloe and Nett? Because it's... Cause it, is it supposed to, I think it's supposed to sound like a Chansky. It sounds more like one of the girls that we get when he's falling in love with the dispenser. It sounds like her a little bit. I'm not sure if it is, but it could be her. But yeah, but, that, that, but as you say, calling to the empathy of him that he hears that and he wants to naturally go and find out what that is. If it is Kachansky, then because Chrissy was mentioned, go and find a home in the episode. So there's also the idea of is it. JMC owned oxygen. Yeah. Or like, uh, or like the supply, like you're no longer a crew member, so you're no longer entitled to free oxygen. M- might want to understand the word I'm saying, but I'm immediately thinking of the episode M Core that kind of has shades of that, which I think is series 12, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Unless you've got anything else, it is time for us to depart. Matt. <laughs> thank you for joining us on these two episodes. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Kurt. Thank you. Thank thanks, Kurt. You, thank thanks, Kurt. You. There's been no smeg ups there whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thank you for having me. No, I say, yeah. I mean, I've been really looking forward to reaching series ten. So uh, I'm, and I'm, I'm actually quite excited to to, to listen to the the other four as a as a listener. It's a, a short time away before we can start watching Red Dwarf 11. We're a third of the way through. third of the way through. And, uh, yeah, we'll be watching that in, in the near future. So before that, though, we do have four episodes to go. Matt, thank you again. Where can people find you online? The quickest way to find me would be to go to Linktree slash Matt Latham, which has links to all my, all my sorts of stuff, um, including Pick a Decent Music Podcast, Ask Us About Loom, Podcast about point and click adventures and other sorts of stuff if you are so inclined to be interested in a little more. Excellent. Mark? At Mark Adams HC on Twitter and Instagram, at Chucky Vision for my Chucky podcast. And if you're in, and if you live in Manchester, I run a pub quiz. It's dead good. It's at Head in Stretford every Wednesday, eight o'clock. That's not social media. That's like, where can people come and get you? Yeah. <laughs> Come. I've actually had a team turn up because they listen to this podcast, yeah. which is pretty fucking amazing. Wow. I was delighted. And um yeah, they only knew about my quiz because they listened to this and they were like, well, I'll go and meet him, which is fucking batshit, really. So I wow. thought I'd advertise that. Yeah, great stuff. You can find me on Linktree at Linktree forward slash R Muldrake, uh, R M U L D I A K E. You can find my Star Trek podcast, uh Make It So. On Linktree, forward slash make it slow. Make it slow. <laughs> it's, seriously, it slow. I'm so tired. I am so, so tired. Make it, make slow, it slow, Jim. Make it slow. Make it slow. Make it slow, Jim. Uh, make it so on Linktree. And the Magic Box pod for my Lost podcast, which is going to be showing episodes or hearing episodes and whatever else I can talk about, is going to be talking about episodes from the show from the 20th anniversary the 22nd of september 2024 but we are showcasing episodes on the run-up to it so please come and find me on there other than that thank you all for joining us and for listening in to another episode of red dwarf and our coverage of it until next time remember as always <laughs> that's because you didn't think ahead the snickered the snickered and comatose
Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams That's and me. Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network. That's us. <laughs> 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 <laughs>